precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome any visitors that's visiting here with us. Always glad to have visitors to come and be with us in our services. And we appreciate your presence. And you listening out in the radio listening audience, I most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. We want to be a blessing to everyone possible. Uh, just the day before yesterday, my wife and I came out of the hospital and met a dear old black man. He's been over with years and uh, and he wanted to know where the emergency room was. I showed him. I said, this is Preach Edwards. I've tried to help a lot of people find the way. He said, I hear you. I hear you. And what he meant was he heard me on the broadcast. And you never know whenever uh, somebody's going to hear you, regardless who they are, whether it be red, black, white, or yellow, uh, city slick as the country people, mountain people, or valley people. You don't know where the radio message is going. And that's the real joy and thrill of preaching the gospel through a medium of radio. And you pray for this hour coming up. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Today I want to begin reading a verse 2 there, page 1315 uh, in the original Schofield Reference Bible. This will be tape number 337. I'm going to speak today on Satan's ten most wanted. Now you know the uh, criminal judicial system today, our government, they have always have listed the ten most wanted people in America, criminals. And so they set out to catch those ten most wanted. I'm going to speak to you on Satan's ten most wanted. It'll be tape number 337. So if you write in for it, you can call in by title or write by request it by title or by number. And we'll send the tape out to you for a gift of, of $3. And that gift is used to help defray our radio expense. And then if you'd like to have my book on the 52-7 point outlines on the Holy Spirit. It's in beautiful green color. It has a picture of my wife and myself on the back of it. You send it a gift of $4, request it, we get it in the mail to you. And then if you'd like to have uh, Brother David Lewis's wonderful book on the Song of Solomon, that's a masterpiece. You ought to get this and read it. He explains each verse, each word, and he's done a marvelous job. I've got it in the hands of a few preachers, and they really appreciate it. And you need to write in, just add another dollar or so. When you're writing for my book, or just write for his book. It costs him a dollar more to mail it to you. And whatever you can give to help him in that respect, he appreciates it. He's not out to make any money on his books, but he likes to have the expense taken care of as he sojourns, I'm sure. And so you write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards. Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is our zip code number. Now we thank God for this Independence Day, the 4th of July. We thank God for our great men that fought and died for this country. And we thank God for the sacrifice they made. That's why we have the liberty we have today. It burns me up when I see people tearing up the flag, burn the American flag up attach it to the seat of their pants and walk around. I could take those jaybirds with the hair of their head if I could and toss them all the way to communist Russia. Amen. Now, if people in America don't like America, they ought to get out of it. Our blood, red-blooded men didn't go to the battlefront and fight the things like uh, Hanoi Jane Fonder or any other uh, traitor. That woman was a traitor. You know, in the last few weeks, she's trying to get back in with the, uh, the Vietnam vets, you know, having a meeting and apologizing. Low down devil. Went over there to Hanoi and responsible for deaths of many of our precious men and helped the communists. And if the American people, the American government had had any guts that have brought her back over here and tried to for treason, and as far as I'm concerned, could put in a black bag and send her back over and drop her out over Hanoi. But she should have been put to death with a few others I could mention, but I don't want to take time for it. But now she's going around trying to apologize and get in, and she'll do the same thing again because she's a dirty communist. 
And she's now doing this because she's making more films. And she wants you people and others to go out and, and uh, buy movie tickets to see her films so she can make more money. I wouldn't buy one of those tickets. Every time you buy a ticket to see Jane Fonda, you're helping communism. And I wouldn't do it. She's a traitor, perfidious person. And I most certainly have nothing to do with anything she had to do uh, with and as few others likewise. I'll tell you, I read blooded American men, God bless them, paid their lives, gave their lives, shed their blood, many of them maimed and be crippled the rest of their days. Yeah. And then somebody like that don't fit to live in this nation. And these people don't like America, they ought to get out of it. I mean, get out of it. These long-haired hippies don't like America, ought to get out of it, go to Haiti or, yeah. or go to Communist China or someplace. And if we had a government that had any teeth in it in that respect, we'd do something about it. But right. these politicians, right. they jump around and bow down to all of these minority groups and all that crowd to get votes, no backbone, no conviction, <laughs> don't want to lose any votes. So we're in sad shape. We've got to make the best of it. And there's one verse of scripture that helps me and helps me some, but I just can't to hardly completely arrest the case, and that is the Bible said to fret not thyself because of evil doers, they'll soon be cut off like the grass. And when I began to fret about it, God says, remember that verse, and I go back, and first thing I know, I my blood begins to boil again when I read about what some of these people like old Hanoi Jane Funder did and others, and it stirs me up, it has me up. And these are conscientious objectives. No such thing as a conscientious objective. They're just a bunch of cats. You get saved, it's going to keep you from doing anything for God. But if you're not saved, then he's going to try to keep you from getting saved. Now I'm going to mention the devil of Satan's ten most wanted. And I'll have to move quick to number one. We find Terry Teacher. This man is wanted because he has the audacity to love God's word and teach it to others. He remembers Proverbs 11.30. He that winneth souls is wise. Now that Bible teacher. That Sunday school teacher. That person that's a real student. And want to teach the word of God. In their homes. In their churches. Wherever they get a chance. That's Terry the teacher. The devil's after him. That's The devil wants him. The devil wants to stop him. From trying to teach the word of God. And we need more Bible teachers. We need more good Sunday school teachers and mothers and dads that teach the word of God in their home. We need that today. There's a crying need for it. And so that's one Satan is after is Terry the teacher. The second one is Wendell Worker. Now this man is wanted because he's the answer to the Lord's prayer for labors. The Bible speaks about praying for labors. And so he is the one that answer to that prayer, the Lord's labors. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, Thus saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth labors into his harvest. Now we need to pray that God will send forth missionaries, that God will send forth labors, that God will send forth workers. We need church workers, people that work for God. People that has a mind to work. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible said they built the wall whenever the people had a mind to work. And so we'll build up our churches stronger. We have more in attendance, be able to do more for God when we have some workers that's willing to work for God. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, send me. He said, who will go for thee? Who will go for me, said the Lord. Isaiah said, I'll go. And he said, how long should I be going? God, God said, there's no more cities and no more people to minister to. We have five billion people in the world today and most of them on the road to hell. And there's never many, many people on the road to hell as you find today. And there's much to be done. And we need window worker to get out and work for God. Visit, knock on doors. Uh, talk to those on your jobs and witness for God and do what you can. 
uh, to get things done for God and work in your church and be faithful in working for God in your church. And then we come to number three, and that's all of optimism. Now this man is warning because he is not burdened with cans. You have so many people today that say, I can't, I can't. Uh, you ask him to do something for God, I can't. And uh, would you do this for the Lord? I, I just can't do it. Now beloved, listen, can't never could do nothing. Now you may be able to do more than you realize. Now we know that Oliver here, he, he's constantly heard saying, I can do all things. Through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Great verse of scripture. And whenever you begin to think you can't read that verse of scripture. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Don't say I can't, I can't, I can't. Have you tried? Most people that say I can't have never really tried. You might be surprised at what you can do for God. There's some of you people are sitting out there in the audience right now. Bless your heart. You have a good voice. You've never tried to use it to the glory of God. You can make a good start here in the choir where Tony would train you and help you. And when he detects that you can be a good soloist, uh, singing a trio or a quartet, he'll detect that and he'll line you up uh, with maybe with another for a duet. And you might be surprised what a blessing you can be. But if you never try, say, I can't, I can't, I just can't. Well, you can't and, and can't never could do anything. If you want to do something for God, you have a chance to do it. And serve the Lord and, and find your way to the choir and get in that field of work. That's not the only opportunity you have at Northside. You have an opportunity at Northside to do a lot of things. You can witness, you can do uh, visitation work, you can pray, uh, you can teach, you can uh, do a lot of things that you think you can't do. You can serve as a good usher. And you can serve as a good deacon. A good deacon is a very valuable man in the work of God. We thank God for the deacons. The Bible plainly tells us that they're going to get a good reward if they'll serve faithfully. A good deacon is a man to be faithful in all the services. He's been an example before the other church. He's to work with the preacher and help get the job done. You can't build a church without some good deacons. And the, you need good deacons and uh, you have that ability, maybe you've been selected to be on the deacon board, and your responsibility is that you're to be faithful in example, you're to be faithful in tithing your income into your church, not send it out to Tom, Dick, and Harry, but tithe your income into the work where you're a deacon. That's your responsibility. You expect to do so by your church, and by God expects you to do that. Your pastor expects you to do that. Stand by your work, set a good example. And stand by your work. That's your place number one. If you don't do that, you're falling down on the, on the job. You're letting your church down. And you're letting God's work down where you're a deacon. If you're a deacon, you're an important man. Very important. And greater be your reward. And you remember, you're setting an example in soul winning. And giving. In faithfulness. And standing by your church. And don't sit around like a dumbbell. And let some old blabbermouth. Run your church and your pastor down. Stop them. Tell them to shut up. And if they don't shut up, walk off and leave the jaybirds. And let them go ahead and run their fly traps. Don't listen to them. Don't, don't let anybody run your church down. You deacons have that responsibility. If you let people run your church down, your pastor down, then God will hold you responsible. You be a man. And say, wait a minute, buddy. That's my church. And I'm one of the deacons there. And bless God, you're not going to... Run my church down, my pastor down in my presence. And don't allow it. Shut them up. Let them know you don't, not going to listen to it and they'll soon close up their fly traps. A deacon has a great responsibility. And you need to realize that. And in Romans 8, 28, people say, well, I just can't, I can't, I can't. And the Bible tells you in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord that thee call according to his purpose. And you can do it. Don't say you can't. Can't never could do anything. We ought to have some men here at Northside to pair up on some day, whether Saturday or whatnot, maybe a half a dozen or a dozen, and go out two by two and work in the community and try to get people in. Oh, you say, preacher, uh, that's the preacher. No, it's not the preacher's job. God called the preacher to preach the word of God. That's his responsibility. That's the deacon's job. And that's the other lay member's job to visit and go out, not only 
out in the community, but in the hospitals. And, and that's part of your responsibility as to visit and contact the people in the community. Now, the preacher ought to do it. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not his job altogether. It's mainly the deacon's job to do that. And the other men and women in the church that love God, that ought to be done. And when we're not doing it, we're not doing our job. Number four, there's Kathy character. Now, she's wanted because she lives a holy, pure, clean life. The devil would like to have her. Kathy character. That is the women that live a real, good, clean, pure, holy, dedicated, consecrated life. The devil is after them. The devil wants to stop them because they're setting a good example and uh, helping others along the way. And people see their lives and what they do and realize that they are getting the job done and living a good, clean, holy, Christian, Christ-like life. And a, a Kathy character is sought for by the devil. He wants to stop her. Then we come to Herman Humble. The old Herman Humble is very important. This man is wanted badly because he has the mind of Christ. He's a humble man. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. For him no work for Christ is too small. He's a humble man. And God wants you to be a humble man. Now being humble doesn't mean that you're going to lay down on the floor and let people walk on you and spit on you doesn't mean that. That's not humility. Beloved, to be humble is to be Christ-like and be patient and to be kind and have a humble Christ-like spirit. We need more humble people today. We have too many hard-headed, stubborn, mean, uh, aggravating church members all over the world today. We need more humble church members. Members that love God. Members that that's willing to suffer and be patient and kind. And that's Herman Humble. The devil's after Herman because he wants to stop that kind and get rid of him. The next one is Sally Selfless. Now this lady is wanted because she understands that Christ did not please himself. He came to please others. And Sally Selfless, she realizes she must please others and not necessarily always please herself. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it written, the reports of them that would be thee fell on me. Now when Jesus came, he didn't come just to please himself. Now we didn't, God didn't save us just to please ourselves. Now she's trying to walk in his footsteps according to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. As she knows that love does not seek its own. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. I reminded the Jewish couple one time. This man had a lot of trouble. And, and uh, he had lost his business and lost his, uh, uh, well, he lost everything he had, all of his wealth. And a Jewish brother took him in. And so uh, the Jewish brother took him in and, and looked after his family, even saved his little daughter from drowning in the swimming pool and Saved her life and helped get this Jewish brother back on his feet. And finally when he got him back on his feet, he went out in his own business and did well. He was doing wonderfully well. And then uh, uh, later on the man that helped him had hard luck, misfortune. And he said, well I don't, I, I don't know just what to do. And I have to think about this brother that he helped out. He even saved his little daughter's life. And the brother helped get the brother back on his feet. He said, I'll go help him. And I know it's been a long time ago, but I believe if anybody will help me get back on my feet, he will. So he went to see him. And he said, uh, uh, Brother A.B., he said, uh, I come to see you. He said, I'm in a bad financial trouble and can't make ends meet and lost my business. And, and since uh, I helped you get on your feet and back yonder many years ago, Took you in our home and fed you and clothed you and saved your little, wife, a little daughter's life in the swimming pool and did those things. He said, I thought maybe I'd come and ask you now if you would help me. He said, well, said, uh, said well, well, said, uh, said, what have you done for me here lately? And so that took care of that. Now, people soon forget about what you've done for them back yonder. They want to know what have you done for them. Lately, have you done anything for me this past week? 
You might have helped them tremendously back yonder 10 years ago. But they want to what, what you do uh, this past week for me. How, how about two weeks ago? What you do for me? You should never forget people that help you and do things for you. I don't care if you, if you, you live a, a, to be 50 or 100 years old. Don't ever forget it. Always remember and appreciate it from the depths of your soul. And you, you realize then that God will bless you and help you. Number seven, that's Fred forgiveness. Now this man is wounded because he has the capacity to forgive. He had, he's heaped a lot of coals of fire upon people's heads for many years. Romans chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. Paul said there, if people do you wrong, be good to them. Heap coals of fire up on their head. And in that way, you'll come out on top. God said, vengeance is mine. And, we, and I, I'll repay. God said, I'll take care of them. I know, I know how they mistreated you. You just heap coals of fire up on their head. Now, that doesn't mean like it sounds. Back in those days, they'd go from place to place, have to borrow some coals of fire to carry it over to their home to start a fire. And uh, because their fire had burned out and they needed some coals and they had containers they put up on their heads to put the coal in and they had put the coals of fire in there then they'd go back and start their fire. Now Jesus said do good to them, heap coals of fire up on their heads and keep heaping coals of fire up on their heads. When they need that help, then render that help, do good for evil. God said vengeance is mine and I'll take care of them. They have mistreated you, I'll, I'll hell them. You just go ahead and do good. Kind of reminded me, the dear black woman one time came to the reverend and said that uh, her husband was mean, as could be, he beat her, he cussed, he didn't want to come to church, he was stealing, he lied, he done everything in the catalog wrong and mean to her, didn't want her to come to church. And the pastor said, well, now, sister, said, uh, said don't you remember the, the good book tells us that you ought to heap some coals of fire up on his head. Have you ever tried doing that? She said, no, Sir Evans. Said, I, I think never, I think never done that. But said, I poured some hot scalding water on his head. And that didn't seem to help him any. Well, there's always a way to get things done if you do it in the right way. And the Bible says to heap the coals of fire upon their heads. Number eight is, is greater growing. Greater growing is a lady and this lady is wanted because from the first day she received Christ, she's not ceased to grow. When a little baby is born into your home, and that little baby begins to nurse. And you can see the little thing enjoying nursing, and, and you just almost can see it growing. And week by week, it seems like it changes to a certain extent because it continues to grow and it's healthy. And it thrills you that that baby is healthy and growing. And you like to see that in your family. You become very uneasy if you had a child that's deformed, that never growed. It disturbed you greatly, and there's a lot of them like that. Well, the same things applied in the family of God. That's not the thrills of preaching more than to see his members when they come to the house of God bring the holy book. And whenever he reads the scripture, turn in that holy book. And uh, follow him in the scripture and to read and study that holy book and grow in the Lord. Now you got to start taking the milk. You got to take the milk. Now you can't understand the word of God. The old lady told me yesterday, said a lot of things about the Bible I don't understand. Well, that, that's, that's unnatural. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Now when you first get saved, this Bible you don't understand it. I didn't know the Old Testament from the New when God saved me. I thought I'd start in the book of Genesis and no, look, my Bible looked too thick. I better just go over to Revelation and see how the story come out. It doesn't work that way. But uh, in a matter of very few weeks after God saved me, I had read the Bible through, didn't learn anything much, but I went through it. And I've been going through it ever since. Uh, reading it and, and trying to let some of it go through me. Now you got to really study the Word and compare scripture with scripture and listen to the preacher and not sit back and read song books and, and poems and uh, look at flowers and pick at babies and talk to somebody beside you. You expect to learn anything. You'll never learn anything. You got to listen to the man of God expound the word.
That's what you come to church for. You don't come just to see and be seen. When you come to the house of God, you to come in a worshipful attitude and worshipful spirit and say, I'm going to God's house. I want to learn more about the Word of God. And if you'll follow this pastor, I'm talking about you people here in Northside, if you'll follow me in the Bible, I'll promise you on the authority of God's Word, I'll point you out something in this book that you need to know. And when you hear it, then don't just cast it away from you, cogitate upon it, go out and meditate upon it, let it become part of you, assimilate it, and you grow in grace, and you begin to understand the Word of God better and better, or easier and easier, however you want to state it. And the more you learn, the more you can learn. But you got to dig in there. you got to search it out. you got to uh, read it and read it and reread it. The average church member today doesn't read the Bible one half as much as he reads the newspaper. The average church member today doesn't read, would read the Bible uh, one one-tenth as much time as he looks at TV. No wonder, no wonder people are starving to death spiritually. Know nothing much about the things of God. Spend all your time looking at TV and reading newspapers and other literature. You've got to get in the book. The Bible is the book. And then everything else must be laid aside or you'll never know anything about this book. When you come to the house of God, come in to hear what the man of God has to say. And listen to him as he preaches. And then don't let the devil steal it away from you. He'll steal it away from you if you, if you let him when you go out the door. The first thing you'll do is start grabbing for it. And he'll steal it away from you. The number nine is Arcilla Urgent. Arcilla Urgent, this is a lady. This lady is wanted because she understands the urgency of the gospel all too well. She knows that time is running out. She knows she don't have much time to work. She knows the end is near. And she is constantly using the word like Today, 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 uh, behold, now is the day of salvation. Now it's said that don't wait until tomorrow. Now is the time. Behold, today, if you hear his voice, need to do it now. And she's a person who won't take no for an answer. If you try to talk to her, say, now, I, when I get squared away, pay my bills and, and get in better shape with my neighbors, I'm going to get saying, no, no. She said, no, no, not now, right now. You got to nail people down right now. You can't let them off the hook. Not at all. They'll put you off. They'll say, well, I'll go with you next Sunday. Or I'll try to, I'll think about it. I'm, I'm going to take this in consideration. If you've got them on the hook, keep them on the hook. Don't let them get off of the hook. Tell them right now, right now, you may be in hell before tomorrow. Right now is the time you need to do business. You may die before you get home. You may have a heart attack. You may have a car wreck. You may have a stroke. Right now is the time you need to do business with God. Don't play about tomorrow. And if they try to get you talking about yesterday, say, no, no, uh, that's behind us. Forget those things behind. Right now, this very minute, we're doing business now. And so she's the person that wants business done right now. She's not going to take no for an answer. And she's going to get much done for God. And because she wants it done now. And if you let people get away from you, you start out fishing. Start playing around with the fish. And, and they tell me, if you catch a big old bass on that a uh, fish rod, if, if you don't work that thing or just right, that, that bass will get off of that fish hook. But if you know how to hang him and bring him in and you bring a big one in, but you want to play with it, fool around with him, you get tangled up somewhere, you never get him, or he'll get off of the hook. And you can't, you can't play with sinners and people about this, this time business. Because now is the time. Behold, today is their salvation. Behold, now is accepted time. And the devil, Wants to get rid of that person that always knows they ought to be a minute person. And they ought to get to see people doing it now. Do it now. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it now. Uh, just remember to tell people right now. Don't fool around. You may be in hell tomorrow. Now, now is what you ought, when you ought to do something about this bit. Oh, you say, uh, uh, preach, I'll consecrate myself. And I'll do what I need to do when I get straightened out. And I'll do this. No, no, not, now is the time to start. Don't, don't wait two minutes. Right now is the time to do business for God. Make up your mind now. Tell God right now you're going to do it. Don't say I'm going to talk it over my wife and talk it over my husband. Right now is the time that you and God needs to get together and do some business. And don't fool around about it. Dwight L. Moody was a minute man, a second man. He'd take no for an answer. He said, no, no, we're doing business right now. 
And then you win that person to God. You say, hey, young Christian, come here. I'm going to hook you up with this young Christian. And I want you to get out here and do something for God right now. Don't fool around about it. Right now, go tell people what God's done for you. Be back here in service. Now, come back right away. As soon as you get back, get back here. Now is the time. Don't say tonight. Right now is the time to do business for God. And the devil doesn't like a person like that. That's a, that's a minute person. That's urgent. That wants things done now before people die and go to hell before the devil steals away what you know they should do. Finally, that's earnest encouragement. This man is wanted because he builds up and encourages those who are weak and about to fall. Now that's one great sin that many of us Baptists commit. Earnest encouragement. When we find a brother or sister that's down and out and they're discouraged, we ought to do everything in our power to encourage them. Encourage them. Encourage them. Encur Ernest encourage them. He, he's a man that the devil likes to knock out because he encourages people. And if you see somebody next week is kind of discouraged and you need to encourage them and so they'll be in the church here Sunday. If you detect that they're getting a little discouraged out there and the devil is trying to knock them out of their church, you need to get busy. Get busy and encourage them. Get them back in where they need the, the help from God's Word and the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Encourage people. Get on your phone and encourage people. The average person they got on his phone or her phone and encouraged people and did work for God like they gossip and talk about everybody else and talk about neighboring something not worth a dime and waste each other's time. We'd have revival before next Sunday. Right now it's urgent. Now's the time to talk about God and do things for the Lord and encourage people that are discouraged. One of the greatest tools the devil uses is a tool of discouragement. If he can get you feeling bad in your body, if he can get you a, a half sick and don't feel like hardly sitting up, if he can get you worried about tomorrow, if he can point back to you your mistakes in the past, he's really working you over. Now you need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to take courage. My God is my helper. And I'm going to look to the Lord. And don't let the devil discourage you and get you on the juniper tree. And get you down while you feel like throw up your hands and quit and say, well, what's the use? Because if you do that, you are the loser. And the cause of Christ is hurt. And the devil is laughing about it. And he's going to knock that encourager out. If any man or woman sets about to encourage people, that might be your gift. Now let that sink in. That might be your gift just to encourage people, be positive in dealing with them, and encourage them. And everybody you talk to could use a little of that. Have you thought about it? That may be your gift. You might pray about that and begin to think about it and figure out how you're going to go about it. And God will open up more doors for you to encourage people than you ever dreamed of. Encouragement. You need to encourage people along the way because so many people are discouraged today and down and out, and the devil is after that person that can encourage. I have listed to you 10 most wanted people by the devil. He wants those 10 I mentioned. If he can get them, then he got him a good ball team. He's, he's, he's ready to go. If he can get those 10 people, he's well on the way. And don't let him. Get you if you're one of them. Stay in there for God. Thank you. Stand to your feet for a word of prayer.